Sonic the Hedgehog. Alongside the mustachioed one, is quite possibly the most recognisable character in all of video gaming. Whether it's the fact that Sega abandoned all their other mascots and franchises to focus on him, something I'm totally not bitter about, or the game's epic story of an expeditious ultramarine Rhinocene rescuing woodland critters from an overweight techno-savvy ginger. The spiky one has encapsulated gamers for decades now. Now when it comes to his origins in gaming, it's concrete fact that Sonic's first ever video game appearance was in the not really that good arcade game Radmobile. Radmobile. Sorry, Radmobile. Where he's obviously foreseen how he'd be subjected to starring in terrible 3D games for successive console generations, and has preemptively decided to do his best David Carradine impression in the corner of the screen here. But the question here is, what was Mr. Needlemouse's first ever home appearance? Ah, the US release of Sonic 1 on the Sega Genesis on June 23rd, 1991, I hear you not say? Well, if the answer was yes to that, this video would obviously end right here. But astonishingly, the answer is no. Sonic actually appeared in another game beforehand, a video game that no one seems to know exists, let alone remember. And, get this, he was also a villain in it! Ha <laughs> ha! So, hello there, I'm Guru Larry, and I welcome you to Sonic's unknown first home appearance. It's game. Ladies and gentlemen, we proudly present Quick and Silver. May I present to you The Adventures of Quick and Silver, a rather obscure little gem released for the Commodore Amiga, and later on for the Atari ST. It's a title heavily influenced by Japanese console games of the time, and gives off a real PC Engine Mega Drive vibe about it. In fact, if it wasn't for the gradient background that was a common trait in Amiga games, you'd be forgiven for thinking it was on one of those systems. Heck, the object of the game is to rescue the land from evil for the disembodied floating head of an 80s anime princess. Not that the game tells you that until you've beaten it. But it's nice to see that even in the home computer world, video game princesses were completely incompetent at even the most basic of regal duties, this lone hiring protection staff. The music for the game is also created by the legendary composer Chris Holzbeck, best known for all his work on all the Gianna sisters and Turrican games. Chris once again does a stellar job at all the music to this game too, especially the overworld theme which you're listening to right now. But overall, Quick and Silver is quite an enjoyable little platformer that may have passed by a lot of you. Now, Quick and Silver itself has quite the interesting little story behind it. The game was developed by New Bits on the RAM. Never heard of them? Not surprising really, they're actually a proxy for the legendary German developer Factor 5, probably best known for the Turrican franchise, and later on for the Star Wars Rogue Squadron series. Factor 5 were foremost a home computer game developer exclusively at the time, which was quite possibly the worst thing to be in 1991 as a whole industry was shifting towards producing console games. So with commission work to develop AAA computer games being so few and far between, Factor 5 needed some cash pretty quick to stay afloat. That's where they came up with the genius idea of rather than seek massive lump sums for big games, make smaller cheaper games and pitch them to various computer magazines as cover disc games instead. For those of you young'uns out there, cover disc games were the equivalent of PSN Plus or Xbox Live, where each month on the front of the gaming magazine you bought, it would have a couple of full games, completely for free. They usually weren't very good games, normally ripping off some 80s arcade game, but they were free nonetheless, and at least you didn't have to give them back when your subscription ended like nowadays. But with Factor 5's heritage, the games they pitched to magazines were vastly higher in quality than anything ever seen before, even better than most budget games at the time. Of course they didn't want to sully the Factor 5 name with big publishers, so they published the games under a pseudonym, also quite possibly for another reason which I'll go into later, of new bits on the RAM, a 
pretty rubbish pun of the 90s boy band New Kids on the Block, and thus began Factor 5's career as a cover disc games developer, beginning with Quick and Silver, which itself is a pun on Quick and Silver, aka Factor 5's desperate need for cash. Well, they considered it a pun. They are German after all, so give them some kind of break. Well, this is all very fine and dandy, Larry, but what about this whole first home appearance from Sonic you were banging on about earlier, I hear you ask? Well, if you've been paying attention to the game's footage so far, you may have possibly recognised a couple of enemies as characters from other games. And that's Quick and Silver's darkest secret. It contains more copyright infringement than a Chinese Let's Play convention, and it's probably the real reason why they didn't develop the game under the Factor 5 name. For example, you've got Bub here from the Bubble Bubble series being a pain in the rectum as he's ever so slightly too short to hit, Pogo from Nebulous, aka Castle Lane, Tower Toppler, Corio Chan Land, or whatever the hell you call the blooming game in your neck of the woods, that flying power up thingy from Contra, or Grizor, or Probotector. Wow, they seem to love ripping off games with multiple names now, don't they? The player's R9 spaceship from R-Type. The fish boss from Turrican. Well, that's alright as it's legitimate as it's Factor 5's own game. A cyborg Gianna sister. Again, it's kind of acceptable as that's one of Chris Holzbeck's, the musician of Quick and Silver's titles. But then they jump completely off the deep end with a decapitated Mario stuffed on a slinky Zebedee sort of thing. And finally, Sega's very own mascot himself, Sonic the Hedgehog. It's obviously not official, but as with the sheer amount of plagiarism of the other mascots, it is, without a doubt, supposed to be Sonic. So what makes this Sonic's first ever home appearance? Well, as I stated earlier, the first release of Sonic 1 was the North American Genesis edition on the 23rd of June 1991 with a European and a revised Japanese version appearing later that year. The Adventures of Quick and Silver was first published as a cover disc in the UK with issue 7 of Amiga Fun magazine in May 1991, a whopping three to six weeks beforehand. So how did they manage this? Well, the truth is that Factor 5 was so adept at producing games that the adventures of Quick and Silver amazingly only took two weeks to develop from start to finish. You can tell that they cut some corners, such as the fact that there's no animation on the water, enemies are placed in rather awkward positions, and there's only eight levels in total, which all rotate the same overworld underworld themes quince. But it's still quite an impressive feat, even more so when you consider it as made by only three people, even if two of them pretended to be programmers from other studios. Factor 5 had obviously seen preview screenshots and artwork of Sonic 1 from various magazines, as magazines at the time were hyping the absolute heck out of it, thought it was going to be a big deal and simply ripped him into their game. They just snuck their game out before Sega had a chance to release theirs. So what happened to the developer New Bits on the RAM? Well sadly, they only ever made one other game, the Amiga exclusive Metal Law. It's an okay platformer where you're playing as a cyborg cop bloke type thing, destroying dragons and demons running around like they need the toilet around the dystopian city of Neo York. It also can't decide on whether it wants to be E-SWAT or a cut down Turrican. But either way, it's nothing to write home about and was nowhere near the quality of Quick and Silver. Work began to pick up again for Factor 5 shortly afterwards, whom the next year started to develop several Turrican ports and sequels to consoles themselves, before going on to make the phenomenally successful Star Wars Rogue Squadron trilogy, the infamously bad PS3 exclusive Leia, before sadly declaring bankruptcy in May 2009, after the publisher Brash Entertainment, whom they were co-developing a new Superman game with, went into receivership, bringing them down with them. Sadly, possibly down to it not being a retail game and only ever being released on European home computers, outside of its underground fandom, the adventures of Quick and Silver never gained the fame it so rightly deserved. 
Other magazines at the time didn't even touch it until a year later when it was released into the public domain. Amiga Power absolutely loved it when they reviewed it in their public domain segment, giving it the perfect score of 5 stars out of 5. Even if the article lives up to their usual stereotype of being completely clueless about video games, by accusing it of being a rip-off of Rainbow Islands, okay, and completely misspelling the name of the game in the title. But the game is so forgotten, as of the writing of this episode, there isn't even a Wikipedia article about it, even with its noteworthy claim. So I'm probably the first idiot to even notice, let alone point it out. So watch this video age terribly and make me look like a complete idiot when one appears 10 seconds after I've uploaded this. So, in conclusion, while this isn't an official cameo, it is Sonic's first appearance in a home video game, and at least deserves a big old asterisk next to this criminally unnoticed accolade. Also, while I'm here, fun fact, did you know Sega actually licensed Sonic 1 to US Gold so they could make home computer ports to the Commodore Amiga, Atari ST, Amstrad, Commodore 64 and ZX Spectrum? But after the runaway success of the game, they pulled the license to keep it Sega exclusive. Isn't that interesting? But I've been Guru Larry. Goodbye. Hello you! Thank you ever so much for watching this episode. I try my best to bring you completely original research material no one else has ever covered before, so please let me know what you think in the comments. If you want to check out other episodes in the series, there's links below. But don't forget to subscribe to be notified when new episodes are available, and if you want to be super awesome, check out my Patreon to help me make future episodes. But once again, thank you ever so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.